Welcome. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives on Thursday, April 7th, 2022. We are continuing our conversation on S-287, an act relating to improving student equity by adjusting the school funding formula and providing educational quality and funding oversight. And uh, we're delighted to have the Education Commission of the States join us today to help us put in perspective um, Vermont and the country and, and provide an opportunity for, for committee members as well to ask other people. So with that, I would like to uh, welcome start first with um, Joe Moore. So for the record, can you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Chair Webb. Uh, for the record, my name is Joel Moore with Education Commission of the States. Uh, it's great to be here with you this morning. We really appreciate the invitation. It's been, I mean, I, with the with COVID, it's it's hard not to be in there with person, but it's opened up these new opportunities that allow us to be here and respond a little more nimbly to y'all's questions. And uh, thanks for having us here to talk about uh, the S-287. Uh, Chris and I uh, worked a little bit with the task force last fall and then watched some of the other testimony this week to get a little bit of perspective. Uh, but like I said, my name is Joel Moore. I'm part of the state relations team and education commission of the state. So if you're not familiar with us, we are, a national nonpartisan education policy center created in law in all 50 state statutes with the purpose of helping education policy leaders from around the country and across the preschool to workforce spectrum learn from one another. So we work with governor's offices, departments of ed, boards of education and higher education and legislatures to, to uh, learn more about the national perspective because we know that informed policymakers are gonna create better education policy for their students. So again, we're nonpartisan and don't advocate for any specific policy. We can't tell you what's right for the folks of Vermont. You all know Vermont the best and its context, but we can tell you what the other 49 states are doing and what that looks like for them. So with that in mind, I will turn things over to Chris Duncombe, who's a senior policy analyst with our team who specializes in school finance to share a little bit about our resources and answer some of the specific questions that the committee shared with us ahead of this meeting. So we will... Uh, with that, Chris. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Chairwoman Webb, members of the committee for having me here today. Um, I've been invited to present on English learner funding policies that exist around the country. Uh, so I'm going to provide uh, an overview of some research that we've recently updated uh, just at the October of last year. And then um, particularly hone in on a few examples of states that have done tiered funding structures based on English proficiency, and then invite questions and, and a broader discussion. Hopefully you all have the PowerPoint slides available to be viewed or a handout and might assist you as I'm kind of going through and laying out a few of this, these pieces of information. So we have two documents from you. It looks like you're talking about the one that's called English Learner Funding Models. Yeah, I'm, I'm largely going to be going through the PowerPoint slides. Do you have that slide deck? I have a slide deck that's titled English Learning uh, Learner Funding Models. Yes, that, that is the one. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. So one of the products that we produce at Education Commission of the States are 50 state comparisons. And this is where researchers at ECS go through state statute, uh, administrative code, state budgets, uh, education agency um, policy documents, and we create a 50 state summary on a particular issue. We updated our um, 50 state comparison <laughs> finance recently, and it covers a variety of topics from the, um, the funding model that states operate, how they count students for funding purposes, and um, what that base funding amount for students, for those states that have a base foundation model. Um, we also look at the funding streams for individual students and districts, such as special education students, EL students, uh, gifted and talented, and districts that are in sparse or rural areas. So that resource is available. Um, there's a link at the end of that PowerPoint slide if you have it electronically, not happy to provide that so that you can um, look through and see what other states have done for each one of these different categories. Uh, for English learner policies, we, based on this review, found the most common approach that states use is that they use a 
weighted funding model. Uh, this can either be a single flat weight or having multiple weights um, that are provided. And that's Vermont is currently um, one of 24 states in DC that has a flat weight. Um, the, the weights range pretty dramatically for those states that do take this approach um, from about 2.5% in Utah um, all the way to 100%, which is double the funding in Maryland. The average that we see is around 36%, median 25%. So both of those percentages are above what's currently in statute of the 20%, although S-287 would, um, would, would actually give Vermont when it's fully phased in, I know that there's a transition period, fully phased in the largest weight in the country. Another 11 states which are orange on that map, if you have the PowerPoint slides, have multiple weights. Again, there's a large range of 5% for the lowest EL category in Texas to 200% for an EL category in New York. That category combines a bunch of different types of students, including economically disadvantaged students, but includes EL students. On how these multiple weights are determined, states have uh, Can you just, I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble following where we are on your PowerPoint. Could you just identify what, what the title of the page is? Yes. That, so uh, on the, I was referring to the map that's single or multiple weights. And that's where a map where you should see purple or orange states. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. And just as a note, I know I've given you a range of weights. The weights, and I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this, are just one portion of what um, equals the total funding amount that students receive. The base funding amount is also a central component, and that's also included on in our 50 state comparison for the states that have a base amount. So I was going to transition to the next slide that says multiple weights. I, I do have a question. Um, can you just go back? I, I want to make sure. I know we've taken testimony on this before, but so. Um, Vermont is alone in having a single weight cover all of the capacity needed to fund ELL. Every other state that uses a weight has, a, has also a foundation base amount. Vermont is unique in that the other states that have a weighted funding approach have a student-based foundation. So yes, there is a base amount that is multiplied by that weight and Vermont is unique in your funding structure where that weighted funding amount does not get multiplied by a base amount because the funding amount is determined locally by the locally approved budgets. Thank you. So the weight alone is carrying the weight. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it also has a, it has a different um, interaction um, in states with a base foundation amount, that weight is um, increasing the funding that is provided by the state and local governments for EL students. In Vermont, because the weight is on after the budgets are approved in determining the tax rates um, is more on the side of who pays. So it has a little different interaction. Okay. And I'm sorry, I have one more question. Um, in the other states, um, is the, is the EL weight applied to a base foundation amount for the average unweighted student? So say you get 10,000 per student and then you apply the EL weight for every ELL student you have, or is there a base amount for an EL student that the weight get applies, that, that the weight is applied to? Did that make sense? The EL weight is, is typically applied to the base amount, although there may be several base amounts. Some states have base amounts for different grade levels. Um, so that EL weight is being applied to a base amount, whether the state has multiple or just one. Okay, so your, your average non-weighted kiddo costs 10,000, that's your base amount, and the EL weight is applied to that. Yeah, and Great. there's okay. sometimes the, the, the mechanics sometimes are, are differ from state to state a bit, depending on if the state local cost share where that fits in. So I, I can't say that there's just uniform across the 
across the map. That's the basic approach. Okay, thank you. Great, so I'm gonna move on to the multiple weight slide. Um, as I mentioned, states, some states have multiple weights, and this is most often based upon a measure of English proficiency off of a statewide proficiency assessment. A couple examples that I can provide. Um, Iowa uses the English language proficiency assessment for the 21st century or ELPA 21. And based upon how students do on that test, they're placed into either an intensive student category or an intermediate slash progressing student category. Uh, the weights for each of those categories is 26% for the intensive, 21% for the intermediate or progressing. So there isn't huge variation between those two weights. An another example is North Dakota and they use WIDA's consortium access placement test, which I believe Vermont also participates in. And they have three weight categories based upon their scores on those WIDA assessments of 40%, 28%, and 7%. States 40, also, 20, sorry, 40, 28, and seven. And you said that was based on what? Was that based on? On the WIDA access placement exam and how they score on that exam. What state was that that does the three? That's North Dakota. North Dakota, thank you. To provide a, a memo that lists all those states with multiple weights and all of their multiple weight categories, if that's helpful. That would be, thanks. Great. Um, states also differentiate by concentration of Yale students. California is an example of this. Um, they have a higher weight for districts that have more than 55% of their students that are Yale, so that would be a very different than the school districts in Vermont where that do not approach that threshold, but they use the 55% threshold and there's an additional weight for students above that threshold within those districts. States also differentiate by grade or program. Texas is an example where they have a higher weight for students that are participating in their dual language immersion program. Um, their regular EL weight is 10% and then in this program is 15%. I will move on to the next slide if, unless there are additional questions. That's good. I'm sorry, I do have a question. Um, the number of Yale students in Maine, um, is that again, the more, the more students, the higher the weight, or is it something like what we're contemplating here where we're adding extra support for districts that have fewer students? I believe it is similar to your approach. I unfortunately, let me pull up. And I think that you and Maine would be the only ones that, that I have seen that have that approach um, where it is for districts, I guess from our economies of scale perspective that have limited number of English learner students would receive more funding. Um, Representative James, I'm going to just, you can just go ahead and, and ask questions if you want. <laughs> we recognize you, you just go ahead and, and go, and go for it because well, you are leading this. So, so I can, I can answer slide. that question. Sorry. Representative James, I'm happy to answer that question. It, so the weight is 70% for school admin units with 15 or fewer EL students, 50% um, for admin units with 16 to 250 EL students. So again, going similar direction to the way your categorical program that's being proposed is designed um, and a weight of, uh, it actually goes back up. So it's kind of a curve, a weight of 52.5% for admin units above that amount. And I know I just gave you a lot of numbers. Um, so I'm again, I'm happy to provide that and follow up if it's easier than me just saying, reading this amount to you. Thank you. That, yeah, that'd be great to send that along. My typing, I ran out of space to type. <laughs> Moving. All right, so going on to the resource-based allocation, and I, 
I'm not going to go into too much detail because I don't think this is an approach that you are currently considering, but I did want to provide some background on this. Um, some states, rather than allocating a dollar amount, will designate certain staff positions for EL students. Most often, this are for instructor positions, but it can also be support positions. There are six states, Illinois, Tennessee, Virginia, Washington, and Wyoming, that take this approach. Among those states, going on to the next slide, um, as I mentioned, instructional positions is the most common approach. Virginia is an example. They require one full-time instructional position for every 50 students. Uh, Tennessee has it a ratio of one to 20. So there is variation similarly in the, the staffing ratios for these positions. And other states set standards for teaching assistants, translators, and intervention supports. This means that um, the, these states have developed a formula that says we will reimburse the cost of so many instructional positions or, or whatever the staffing is? Similar, yeah, they'll have in statute staffing standards that require districts to staff positions at these levels, and then their funding formula will allocate funds to cover the state portion of those positions. Thank you. Keep moving. All right, going to categorical grants. Um, there are five states that provide EL funding solely through a categorical grant program. That's Alabama, Delaware, Idaho, Indiana, and West Virginia. And uh, two states, Colorado and Connecticut, that have a hybrid approach where they have both a categorical grant and a flat student weight in the formula. So this is similar to S-287 that you're currently considering. These, as a uh, clarification for those that are less familiar with categorical grants, um, these are funding streams that exist outside of the primary funding model and are oftentimes allocated as a specific program through a line item in the appropriation bill. There are, is a lot of variation in the structure of the categorical grants. Uh, for example, Delaware has created an opportunity fund that combines both English learners and students from low-income backgrounds. Um, they list out several expense categories that the funds can be used for, but it also includes a really broad-based category, expenditures necessary to provide additional services for EL students and students living in low-income families. So it really provides broad discretion for the districts to allocate these resources. Um, but local districts are required to submit an expenditure plan to the State Department of Education to receive those funds. So there is... Um, some fiscal accountability um, standards, but um, there is a lot of flexibility to the districts in the use of those funds. Another example is Indiana. And in Indiana, school districts actually have to apply to receive the grant funds. Um, they aren't just awarded, and um, they're awarded on a competitive basis and capped at a maximum of $300 per EL student. So that would be less than the proposed categorical grant program here in Vermont. Another note um, that I saw is going through the categorical programs. A lot of states will cap the number of eligible years for students in a categorical program, um, five years being the most common. Interesting. I will what is the five, I'm sorry. What's the five years based on? I, I wonder if we had a question earlier from Representative Williams about how long it typically takes students to progress you know, from no proficiency to proficient, is, is five years a magic number around that or? So I wish, I have not had a chance to review the literature to know if five years is the expected time that it should be to achieve English proficiency. Um, so I think that is a great question. This is just, it seems to be the common trend among states that have these grant programs. Um, but UCS does have another 50 state comparison that we link at the end of this presentation on English learner policies generally. And we have um, the policies that state have for English learners being reclassified to no longer be an English learner. So we have that for all 50 states as well. Thank you. On uh, the next slide, we list out the two states that have a hybrid approach, uh, Colorado and Connecticut. Um, 
while the weights are still a primary vehicle of delivering funding for English learner students, uh, the size of their grant programs and the weights vary quite a bit. Colorado's grant program is 25.3 million, or it was before. I think the latest budget is increasing that. Um, but when we did this um, review, that was the amount, uh, which I estimate based on EL enrollment to be about $250 a student. Um, and they have a smaller weight of 8% in the formula. In contrast, Connecticut has a, a very small grant program of just 1.9 million, which I estimate to be about $50 per EL student and a much larger weight in their formula of 25%. Again, the proposed weights when they're phased in and the categorical grant program proposed in Vermont would be larger than both of those um, amounts. So um, the next slide on, I'm, I just have weights and grants vary in size and I'm just trying to re-illustrate a point that I've raised uh, kind of throughout this presentation that states are kind of all over the map in terms of their EL weights that are used. And this occurs um, for a variety of reasons. Um, it can be because of the states have different um, academic outcome objectives. It can be about because of the different demographics in the state. And it can also because states face different financial constraints. Um, and so that is why a lot of states like Vermont have gone the direction of commissioning studies, um, which can either be cost studies like what Dr. Colby did or professional judgment panels like a lot of the work that APA Consulting. <laughs> um, a few studies that I wanted to highlight in other states that might be helpful. Um, given the interest in potentially tiered funding, Michigan, Michigan commissioned an APA consulting study in 2018, where they recommended weights based on the WIDA access score, um, which I believe is the ELL placement test that you use in Vermont. Um, so I can provide that link. And um, Maryland's Kerwan Commission also did a cost estimates for doing their weight of the 100%, which um, based upon their review came out to about 18,600, um, which is a little below the 24,000, although you guys are looking at different weights um, that you had discussed um, for your formula. In terms of ECS resources, um, there is the 50 state comparison on K-12 funding and a 50 state comparison on English learner policies. I mentioned that it has the reclassification process um, in that 50 state on EL policy, policies, but also has um, a lot of other information, including like certification requirements for instructors and how states define and identify EL students because that um, differs from state to state as well. Um, in addition to that, we have a memo that summarizes a lot of the information that I've shared. Um, I will provide the additional um, resources that we discussed on Maine. And um, there's also a table at the end of that document that has all the funding amounts for all 50 states that may also be a good point of reference. So with that, I'm happy to open it up to questions and discuss further. One quick question, um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Representative James. I'm looking at the language. I know when I started teaching, it was ESL, then it became EL, and I'm now seeing ELL and now EL. Can you help us a little bit? What's the what's the term that's being used now? In you know, what's the vernacular and what's the federal naming? What's the federal law for the name? Um, I'm not sure. In terms of federal naming, I'm I might it might still be ELL. I'll have to double check on that. Um, there is. I wouldn't say a agreed upon term. There's a lot of different terms that are used. ELL and EL seem to be the most common right now, um, but there are also other groups and organizations that have been looking at more um, asset-based approaches. Uh, I know Emergent Bilingual is another one that has been used. Um, I believe there are, there's um, a few other terms that are being thrown around. Um, I don't know if there is a consensus-based term, um, but there are some options. Okay, thank you. 
Um, Representative James, I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay, sure. I'll just I'll toss out my last question, and then um, it looks like folks have some questions around the table. Um, just curious. I, I know you can't comment on policy, but curious if you can provide any frameworks. Um, that would help us take a look at the uh, cutoff amounts and, or the cutoff numbers and the grant amounts that are set up in S-287 right now, um, which I'm not looking at the bill, but it's something along the lines, if you, you know, if you have zero to so many students, you get 25,000 and something to 25, you get 50. And um, we're just trying to figure out if those are the right cutoff amounts and if those are the right grant amounts. Yeah, and it, it depends on somewhat of what you're trying to achieve. Vermont is really unique in that there's one, not a large EL population, and then it, two, it's concentrated in just 10 or so of the districts there. Um, so I'm assuming that that was designed to round to provide categorical grant funds to those districts that are have just a few students and may not have kind of economies of scale to provide larger resources to students. That's exactly um, right. I, and so that, that approach makes sense, but I, I would note that that would exclude the other districts entirely. Um, while they would, they would be see, receiving the larger weight that would go through the formula, um, they wouldn't be receiving the categorical grant funds. So the possible consideration around um, having some funds available to those districts, but that really depends on what your policy goals are. Um, the policy goal was it, every, everybody will receive the weight. So the weight is across the state. Um, I believe that the, the statistically, um, the conclusion here is that the weight in and of itself won't deliver sufficient taxing capacity to districts that have a very small number of ELL students, even just to hire like a, a, a part-time teacher. So we're trying to bring, we're trying to bring those districts that have fewer numbers of ELL students up to some sort of floor, make sure they can hire, hire an instructor and provide the services they need. So it would be, they would have the weight plus this additional little boost. And, and that makes sense. And I think that that would be a very state specific cutoff based upon the demographics in the state if I were designing it. So I, I think it kind of makes sense to, to have that cater that to what you did in Vermont, but I can also provide the cutoffs that Maine did since they also had a similar approach. That'd be great. Representative Austin. Yes, thank you. I'm just wondering, I know this is a funding discussion, but I always think of funding hopefully uh, resulting in proficiency outcomes. With all these models, is there any one that kind of stands out as this works in terms of increased proficiency and in targeted, you know, um, acquisition of English language? I haven't seen a connection between the model and improved outcomes. Uh, it's more of the amount and improved outcomes. Um, and I think that is why states have gone the direction of cost studies like you have done with Dr. Colby to try to figure out what that right amount is to achieve the desired outcomes for the state. Um, so I, I, I know that there's a lot of different approaches out there and sometimes it's, it's more about designing it around how your form formula is structured and what the demographics are in your state. Um, because I think any of these models could achieve desirable outcomes if they're um, delivering the appropriate number of resources to the students. Thank you. Representative Connor. Yeah, thank you. That, um, finding the, the it'd be great if you could just say, yeah, this is the, the, the way it works. This is the best way to do it. <laughs> We're very unhappy that you can't tell us that. <laughs> uh, but on that on that note, um, I'm somewhat intrigued by the resource-based allocation funding model uh, because it really says money for instruction. And uh, could you talk about perhaps what some of the challenges are with the resource-based allocation? design yeah the challenge is is local flexibility um so if there are certain programmatic services that you want to provide that aren't people um the resources to do that may be limited 
And so that is one of the reasons why there's been a trend towards student-based foundation models. Um, but what the advantage, as you point out, is that it is guaranteeing um, a certain number of positions or people that are there to work with students. Um, so it really is, is a trade-off and you can try to achieve that with your existing model through um, what is included in the categorical proposal here in S-287. Um, sorry, I have to keep looking over at the number to make sure I have it right. Um, is to have some reporting requirements to see how districts are using these funds to make sure that they're using it for a desired purposes like instructors. Yeah, well, I guess uh, because of our funding system is so different and not using a foundation formula that even if there aren't, that we can always make up for the local resources flexibility because local districts make their own spending decisions. That's true. Yeah, it's very interesting though, thank you. Other questions? And did you have more? I think I, I'll just tell folks, if you look at some of the sites that they have given us, it's really quite fascinating. Um, I've definitely been looking at the 50 state comparison on, on how is an English language learner defined, which is one of the things that we're doing in this bill. And it's interesting to see that we basically just tie it to the federal law, whereas other states actually have different definitions. Are those definitions that tend, well, they can't be more limiting than, than what the federal definition is, but they are more expanding definitions. That's correct. Okay, I'm looking, I'm not seeing any other questions at this point. Um, probably what usually happens with this committee is we'll come up with those, those questions after you've left. <laughs> and uh, mind us being able to reach out again once we've had a chance to mull over this information. It would be very helpful. Yes, thank you for all the committee members for your interest and engagement and, and definitely happy to, to follow up with any questions that occur and we'll provide those additional resources. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you all, it was great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Well, just one quickie. Oh, oh, wait, are you still there? Yes. Yep. This is what we do. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Make sure that you guys include this on your little running memo of all of the work and support that you've provided to the state of Vermont for our ongoing you. efforts to stop being scoff laws here. <laughs> <laughs> Annual <laughs> dues. <laughs> Keep tabs. Okay. It's wonderful to work with you. We'll talk okay. to you soon. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Well, that is it for now. Um, we've got uh, the auditor coming in at one o'clock. Um, I know that we have some time on Friday that says mark up and vote on this bill. I'm going to say that I personally am not ready to vote on anything. <laughs> so we will not be voting on this bill. But I would like to see if we can bring back um, uh, Amanda, if we if this chance we can bring back Amanda and and uh, no, you're already here. Bring back Anne and Brad um, either at that time or if there's any time later today. We actually have some time. Okay, let's send him some. Let's send Brad the questions. Yes. Will you will you do that? Um, yes. Representative James, great. With Peter, with Rep Conlon, we will put our heads. Together. Yeah, I can't even remember what the question was. <laughs> okay. I'm on it. If Lori is shortish tomorrow. If, we anticipate that that might be moved to a late morning. Yes. Or will it hold till one? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Um, we should definitely plan on that. I'm also okay. seeing if we can get any anything on PCBs on, on our bill, which is a good thing. I am following up with my question on what's happening in New Hampshire. There actually is a bill that really is moving forward. I've sent that bill. <laughs> I believe it's out of the education committee and I'm following up with, with um, with, uh, this is the age 22 issue. This is the age 22 issue. Um, so if New Hampshire takes care of it, then everything is, is hunky dory. I don't think I've used the hunky the term hunky dory in about 15 years. <laughs> I just it. Um, I've heard you say that before. <laughs> okay. Anything else that we need to discuss? Just looking at, at our list. Go ahead. Uh, well, I really just back on, on 287 mm -hmm. and the EL discussion. Um, 
and you know we've got a timing issue. So are are there sort of parameters that we're you know guardrails that we should keep in mind as to not letting our discussion go too far afield because we certainly could revamp the entire EL funding system despite the work that the Senate already did. I just I'm a, I'm, a, I'm concerned that we may head in that direction. I just wonder if we should say we're going to sort of stick with the model of the hybrid thing or or not. I, I just it's just I throw it out there as a point of um, Thank you. debate. Thank I know you. that there's an awful lot of interest in getting deeper and deeper into ELL mm -hmm. and understanding it. It's fascinating, and and we're we're really at sort of the uh, uh, super <clears throat> superficial level of this. However, we just need to figure out how it's relating to this bill in moving forward. Um, I have a reflection on that. Yes. Um, maybe this is just me, but in, in my mind, I have great clarity around this, which is that we we don't have, I don't think, the time or the capacity to set aside the work of the task force, ask Dr. Colby to recalculate the weight, start looking at different models. You know, so in my mind, where the testimony is taking me anyway is to two to three succinct sentences if 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 anything so if we find this is interesting in my mind where we're heading is whether we ask for a future report back on this to take a look at tiered funding or to take a look at the ELL weight in my mind it's like what are the what are the cutoff levels and the grant amounts, that might be something we could tinker with if we can get an easy answer for the categorical aid portion. The concept of tiered weights is something that in my mind, all we're trying to figure out is whether that's something that we build into the bill as a report back at X date. Yes, we're, that's where I'm going we're with not this. doing that. We're not doing this this week. <laughs> we're not doing it this year. No, we're not doing it this yeah. session. And I don't wanna slow down this bill. It, you know, in my mind, we all talk about must pass bills. For me, this is a must-pass bill, and so the, that's where I'm heading. Is I was appreciating the language that um, the agency has sent over. Yeah. Which is, uh, the, the, the language always felt a little bit shaky to me, and I'm appreciating that we're getting some better definitions about yeah. who we're talking about. Much more specific. Yeah, so it, 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 be after we speak with Brad, I, I would be inclined to add those to our bill, those recommendations to our bill. Representative. Yeah, I'm just uh, I'm just wondering about resources. You know, I just have no idea whatever we pass. I mean, are there resources out there to uh, accomplish, you know, what we want to accomplish? How many ELL teachers are are we looking at staffing or is everybody all set? You know, Probably. I'm sure it's a concern and I'm sure it's going to be a concern going forward. I'm not sure we can address that in this bill. Right. I, I just don't, I don't want to address it. I just want to mm -hmm. know it. I, I so. think it's a very good question. I think it's something we don't have an answer to. And it's certainly something that, that we're I think we're all thinking about in terms of all the staffing yeah. that we're dealing with. But the AOE would know, right? How, they would know how many ELO teachers we have now and how many uh, are possible. Can I ask? Secretary French, that question, there was some question about um, licensing. I, I think they would <clears throat> tend to, I be able to tell us how many are like licensed or certified now yeah. and what's and coming. They're not going to. I heard 40% of teachers are on the um, provisional. What, provisional. Yeah. So I just, you know, was, but I think that's general ed teachers. I, I'm not sure that's yeah. the LL yeah. teachers. Yeah. I didn't know if, like, anyway. I think I think that that is an issue going forward. I'm quite sure we're not going to be able to address that issue mm -hmm. within the next few days. Yeah. Um, in this bill. Yeah. I think that is a conversation, but I think maybe not in this bill. I think yeah. that, that's just a bigger policy piece around workforce development and teacher workforce development, and that you know organizations uh, NEA is certainly working on that. But that's much beyond the scope of this session. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know. I know for this. Yeah. It's just yeah. something that's like. You know, we're looking at, you know, we're looking at programs that are, the numbers are going to increase, the number of students, mm -hmm. the right. students. They're coming. With <laughs> Afghanistan and probably Ukraine. I, I they speak yeah. English. I don't think they're the ones that need well, it as much as the they, Somali. They're um, going to have to still be a part of yeah, they have to be evaluated. And it, it, it's, we're, we're correcting that so that we're defining who, who they are based on 
from federal definition. So, so um, I guess I'm curious to know what what are we looking for from Brad James? I, I was a little unclear as to the specifics. I've forgotten what the question was. I'm writing to him right now. Um, what I had wanted to ask him was um, just to remind us all of what the 2.49 weight represents. So we had some questions about whether that encapsulates the the range of cost differentials across the state from high concentration districts to a district with one and from students with limited proficiency to students who are almost proficient. So just to remind us all of what that 2.49 weight captures so that we can have a more informed discussion about whether we even need tiers. Maybe the weight itself already in some ways I extended the tiers. If I remember That's my question for Brad. Brad from Tammy Colby that, that they did look at the, the wide range, but you were on the on the task force. It's my that's my recollection too, and that's what I think Brad's gonna come in to tell us. And if Tammy were around, we could have her come in and tell us yeah. that. But so, you know, if the 2.49 weight already captures what we're trying to accomplish with a tiered approach, then we're wasting our time talking about a tiered approach. That was my that that's my primary question. Yeah. And then also um, we had thought Brad might Brad or someone might shed a little bit of light on the cutoff levels in the grant amount, especially with there's that gap. We cut off at 25, but federal funds don't kick in till 50. So what are we doing with that? Why six? Why 25? Those were my Brad James questions. Yeah, I'm concerned. Like that, that one that you just mentioned is, is a policy question. He may not be able to answer, but but maybe he's got the and a lot of it was stuff that Tammy Colby calculated. So I hope he'll be able to answer them. But I don't think Tammy. I don't think Tammy had to do with. Maybe we just need to hear more from Senate Ed. But you know, I don't think Tammy calculated the the categorical aid amounts either. I think that's a Senate Ed. I had to meet him with the finance actually. Or finance. So you know, maybe we just need to ask Ruth. But those are the two questions in my mind outstanding on ELL. And I can copy Ruth on this if you want. See if it was in a break. My outstanding policy question, again, I might just need more information from the Senate or to go back to the report, but is around our um, requirements for general classroom teachers in their professional development or on requirements for understanding English language learners. Um, because to the bigger workforce issue, I think that's actually our biggest leverage point. There's There will be specified EL teachers, but it's it's going to be incumbent on the general education, general classroom teachers to be able to teach to all students better and to teach to a growing English language population. And we don't currently have anything in statute or regulation. It's I'm looking at the state comparison. You know, it's a mishmash, quite a few states do. Um, many of our higher ed programs are developing more and more along those lines. I don't know that we're at a place to put it in here as a requirement now, but if we aren't making that at some point part of the teacher licensure process, you know, the way we do with so, at least some exposure to special education, we're going to miss out on, I think, instructionally a huge leverage point here. So I don't, I don't know where you know, if we need to hear from the standards board on that, or I need to go, I gotta go back and look at. You know, all these things that we're discussing are, are really kind of big. Yeah. And it does seem like there does need to be specific language dealing with EL uh, in, in a report back form or something that will guide. Yeah. See, and maybe this. that's in the report back. We kind of, we kind of, yeah. we kind of put this what's yeah. here into action, see how it works. But then, you know, like, I think the tiered thing is um, probably very important to look at. Yep. Again, back. and I think the requirements of general, you know, the, the training for and requirements of general education teachers is also has to be a part of this. I did see UVM has a minor program. You can minor. Well, it sounds like sounds like that would be part of the that foundational work. I mean, I'm, this might all be captured in the language too that um, Secretary French comes back with. Maybe St. Mike says. One of the, the most outstanding programs oh, I think did. in the country. Oh yeah, I'm teaching teachers of English language learners the test all. So it might be interesting to have someone come in. I don't know. Yes, possible. But <laughs> so gave some of their students the teachers being some of their students at the desk. But it's it's hard because we are we are throwing a big weight at this, doing so somewhat without you know, parameters of, of 
how that weight is to be used because we leave all of those decisions up to the local districts. Just to clarify that, that while the Senate passed it as a weight, there is conversation about looking at it as the cost equity model. Uh, I think there's a misunderstanding what that is. It's just basically the same thing with those numbers as opposed to weight. <clears throat> okay. Um, the break here. And we will be back at one o'clock. <laughs>